Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with iRight Veteran 8888. Today we're going to be doing a field strip and cleaning on an AR-15 and this is a video concept that we've actually gotten a lot of requests from people to do and we've discussed this concept a little bit in the past but we're going to go into a fair amount of detail today and talk about a lot of the things you want to check out to keep your AR-15 clean and lubricated. We're also going to be going over some specialized tools that you probably want to have access to that are very helpful uh, in this process. And this isn't just any AR. This is uh, my old school Colt Sporter. Uh, so this is a pre-band Sporter. Uh, really cool gun. This one's an A2 with a 20 inch barrel. You know, the old school round hand guards, Delta rings. Um, this is pretty OG as it gets in terms of ARs. And you know, the AR-15 is one of America's most popular rifles. And for a reason, they're accurate, they're dependable, they're very well made. And with the prices on a lot of entry level guns coming down so much, you can get a lot of bang for the buck and a lot of good quality, and you don't have to spend a ton of money. So it really does put the AR into the type of paradigm where you can really get a lot of quality for the money. You can, you can buy a higher end AR and have just that much better of an AR, or you can buy an entry level model and it's still gonna run just fine to protect yourself and defend your life, defend your liberty and defend your country ultimately. And uh, AR does not stand for what you think it does, okay? Uh, I would say Armalite rifle of the 15th variety, right? We wanna, we wanna call it that. Or we can just say that AR means America's rifle. I like that better. AR is America's rifle. So we are gonna be cleaning on this guy today and we're gonna go over some things. Before we get started, I would like to thank our friends at Otis Technology for supporting today's video. Any of you guys that have deployed in the last 20 years and all these crazy wars that we've been in, you know Otis because you've been issued Otis cleaning kits, like this uh, pull-through uh, universal cleaning kit right here. I know some of you know, are familiar with this site right here, but they've got a huge line of gun cleaning accessories, many of which we are actually going to use in today's video, as well as solvents and oils, all sorts of kits and things like that. So anything you're looking for in the gun cleaning world, check out Otis Technologies, also Shooter's Choice which we're gonna be using a lot of their stuff in today's video as well. So a big thanks to Otis Technologies for supporting our videos and helping me bring this content out to the masses. All right, so we're gonna get cracking here. Oh, and also make sure you use the code IV8888. You can save yourself 15% off, which is always awesome. So we're gonna get cracking and we're gonna pull this rifle apart. And uh, this is gonna be a field strip. We're not gonna break it down to the smallest component, uh, but we are gonna go through pretty much what you would want to consider when it comes to just everyday basic maintenance to keep your gun running. And we're gonna go over some cleaning techniques and some specialized tools. All right, so we've got our AR-15. This one is an A2. You know an A2 because of the long rifle length stock, the full length 20 inch barrel. This particular one has the round kind of car hand guards, delta ring. This is a pretty bare bones uh, rifle by today's standards. Uh, but don't be mistaken. Uh, velocity is king and it is nice to have the extra velocity and they are quite accurate and this is my old old school Colt so we're keeping our OG of course your magazine release is located right here we're going to drop the magazine we had that in there just for show of course but um, you know, of course an empty magazine we're going to set that to the side we don't really need to worry about that the only thing I would mention on maintenance with your magazines is over time especially if you're shooting suppressed a lot this follower will begin to get a lot of fallout on it. Now this particular one's quite clean, but you know, you would obviously take your, uh, your rags and things like that. Let's just pretend it's dirty. You know, we'll just take and just clean that follower off. And you can also um, grab yourself something like a Q-tip. Just gonna quickly mention this before we even clear this gun, just while we've got the magazine in our hand. You can take a Q-tip and compress this follower and just do this clean up under there and get any amount of dirt and carbon or any kind of blowback. I mean, look, there's a little bit on a Q-tip, but this mag is pretty clean, uh, but that's about the only thing you want to worry about with the mags. And the only other thing I would mention on magazines too, if you've got the old school military magazines with the, uh, the really old followers that are anti-tilt followers, you might want to upgrade your magazines to the anti-tilt followers. That's just me though. Of course, this one has an anti-tilt follower in it. That's an okay industries old school mag, the anti-tilt follower. We're gonna pull the charging handle to the rear and we're gonna visually inspect the chamber. Okay, we see that it's empty. Of course, our dust cover pops open. Uh, this divot on the dust cover has a little detent, see that? And that locks into the upper receiver section and that keeps the dust cover closed. 
Of course, you can see this concave, uh, you know, cut that's in the bolt. All that does is provide the clearance for the dust cover. And once you pull the bolt to the rear, it actuates against it and pushes the dust cover open. All right, that way, when you're traveling about, you're keeping all the dust and bull crap out of your action. Pretty simple, I don't think that requires a whole lot of uh, explanation. The charging handle has a detent on the rear that you have to depress to get it to free from the upper. You should know that, but just you know, pushing that point home. We're gonna pull to the rear and we're gonna look. All right, she's empty, there's nothing in the chamber. The gun's clear. So now, um, what I like to do at this point for cleaning my AR, uh, I pretty much I'm gonna go ahead and always just um, separate the upper from the lower. Now this particular gun is a pre-band Colt, so it has this um, Chicago screw up front uh, that unfortunately you have to take a pair of screwdrivers to loosen. Um, but typically on the AR it uses push pins, so I'm just going to demonstrate this rear pin. The takedown pin is a push pin uh, that is actually retained by a plunger and a spring. So almost every single AR-15 you're going to run into is going to have this type of a configuration. So this is an old school Colt that has the Chicago screw, but that's not typical, but I am going to go ahead and just take the liberty of loosening up this Chicago screw, okay? Um, this is a step that you can more or less kind of skip, uh, but if some of y'all have been around long enough since the ancient days like we have, Chad and I, uh, you, you'll, <laughs> you'll know that uh, the old pre-bands, this was one feature that they made them put on there, uh, was having a, a front takedown pin that was a little bit harder to just take off easily. And if you notice on the Colt lower, there's actually no machining done on the lower to even accept uh, the takedown uh, pin that is self-retained. This is normally where that section would go in here, right, and it would be retained. But of course, you can see this being a pre-band Colt, or a post-band Colt, rather, does not have that feature. We're also going to see some other um, kind of post-band features on this gun as well that we'll point out as we go. So we're going to separate the upper and the lower. We're not going to worry about the lower just yet, but we are going to go ahead and take the sling off. Guys, I think that goes without saying, just take the sling off, all right? <laughs> it just <laughs> it just loops on there. Uh, I don't think y'all need to see me do this, but we're going to just pull the sling off, and that way we can go ahead and just set the lower off to the side, out of the way somewhere, and we're going to concentrate for now on the upper. This is our Chicago screw. We'll go ahead and just put this back in here like this and set it to the side. Again, this is not something that you're going to experience with all of your newer ARs, but you know, for those of you that don't know or haven't ever seen that, that's an interesting little historical reference for the older Colts. All right, so the thing about AR uppers that I wanna kinda of talk about, you know, just briefly if we will, is that there is a lot of different handguard options now for ARs, but, but back in the day, you know, things were pretty cut and dry. You know, you had cars, uh, when I deployed to Iraq in 05, my gun was an A4, which is a more upgraded version of the A2. And the major difference is that on the A4 style upper, you're going to have a pick rail upper, so a flat top upper. Now, the A4 standard has, has become really more of a standard that most manufacturers use now. So the majority of ARs that you're going to purchase now don't have the old carry handle like this Colt. They're going to have a flat top upper that allows all of your accessories to be bolted on and gadgets and things like that. Now, it's still possible. Obviously, a lot of your lesser expensive ARs may have, a, 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 you know, an A3 configuration or A4 configuration with the, with the flat pick rail on top, but then still retain the old school car handguard. So I am going to show you how to remove the car handguards uh, just to give you an idea. And while we have the handguard off, we can discuss the way this, that this gun operates. Because keeping it clean, it's also important to understand how the gun works because obviously how in the world can you keep it running if you don't know how it works? I think that's important, right? Now, some of you have probably seen this tool before. <laughs> now, obviously, we already took the lower off. <laughs> you have to have the lower on in order for this tool to work, and we are going to demonstrate that. In fact, I can do it without even um, putting that forward pin back in because this tool is actually going to pick up on the lower anyway. All right, so we've already got our pin out. We'll just put the lower back on. We're gonna go ahead and pull these car handguards off. Now, you can see this, this gun is <laughs> suspended. Uh, we have the front of the barrel chalked up in a vise using our Otis magnetic vise blocks. 
and I've got it, you know, not stoop, super tight, but tight enough to hold the gun where we can work on it. So we've already pulled that forward pin out. I'm just going to go ahead and put the handguard tool on here. Now, I know what a lot of people, <laughs> what a lot of people are thinking, well, just use your bare mitts and pull it off. Yes, you can do that. Um, you know, and, unless you got some real bare strength, look, I can, I can pull this handguard, uh, this back easily, right? And I can pull this handguard off by hand, right? That's fine. I did that by hand without the tool. But a lot of times putting it back on can be a bit of a chore, okay? And some people, you know, may not have the cuss words required to do it. Now, I've done it so many times that for me, you know, it's, it's not a terribly big deal. See, I just did that by hand. This tool just makes life a little bit easier. You're going to come in from the bottom and this hooks into the lower just like this and you squeeze, right? And you can depress that delta ring and it allows you to more easily remove the handguard. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to pull the handguard off and look at that. Like it actually, it does pivot from top to the bottom. I need to tighten this up just a bit. It does pivot more like this when you use this tool. So really getting the lower hand guard off is kind of difficult even with the tool anyway. So look, I'm just gonna squeeze this sucker and pull it off. All right, and that's gonna be the end of it. These are specific, but well, actually no, they aren't. They, it looks like the, the A2s will go in e either direction. So it looks like the top and the bottom hand guard are exactly identical. You can see the raceway in the, in the metal protection that's in here, the, the, the insert clears the gas tube either for the upper or the lower. So that way you can just drop either side on. I couldn't remember if they were specific, but it appears that they're not. So here we have the hand guards off and you can see that this is an A2 uh, with the delta ring assembly. This is your gas tube, okay? You have your A2 front sight post, uh, sight block. Uh, this contains the uh, actual, um, you know, gas block assembly, your, forward, your uh, front sight base that's uh, adjustable for elevation. There is a special tool for adjusting uh, the front sight post for your elevation adjustments. And then of course, the rest of the barrel that's clamped up in the uh, vice blocks here. And we have an A2 uh, muzzle device on here. We're not gonna remove that, but it can be removed. The barrels are threaded half by 28, all right? So we'll talk a little bit about, let's go ahead and pull this lower back off now that we don't need it anymore. Uh, we, we, we put that on there just to demonstrate the handguard tool, which honestly, I never use. Just break out your bare mitts and pull it off and don't worry about it. But it's nice to have tools in the bag if you need it. We're gonna talk a little bit about the operation real quick because um, there's been some varying points of contention about the, the function of an AR in terms of the way that it actually works. And while there are a lot of historical references to old school guns that use a direct gas impingement, well, what does that mean when we say direct gas impingement? It means that the gases, the projectile is fired, and it travels down the barrel at ridiculously high speeds, butt naked speeds, if you will. And as the, as the projectile passes over the gas block, there's a hole in the barrel that feeds the gas up through the gas block and back into this tube at ridiculously high speeds, of course. And then that gas is then puked back into the action of the gun. Well, yeah, that's direct gas impingement. You are putting gas back into the action, but what's inside the bolt? Well, it's a piston that we're gonna look at. So it's actually a hybrid of a piston design and a direct gas impingement design all in one. It's really both, which is why the AR-15 works so efficiently. It's so smooth shooting. They have smoother recoil forces because of the way the gases expand. And they're very impervious to dirt and debris entering the action because it's a closed system. You see, there's nothing that can really get in there. I could pour dirt and crap, but because of the, the finely fitted parts and the good clearances and tolerances of the AR, uh, it's almost impossible to get too much crap down in the action to keep the gun from stopping. There's been multiple mud tests done on these and things like that, and uh, they've actually held up really, really well. So while we, while we all wanna play the game of, of comparing the AR-15 to the AK-47, uh, they're two, you know, famous rifles, of course, there's gonna be comparisons drawn between the two, but I would say in a miniature dirt war or any, any war or, or situation, I think I would, I would much prefer the AR system 
to just about any other rifle. Uh, and especially as you can see, this is a very easy gun to take care of. To be fair, um, you know, there are some things that are required we're gonna go over that it does require a little bit more training and time to get used to these, but you'll see it's not a big deal. So remember we cleared the gun earlier. We're gonna pull the charging handle back. This time the bolt's gonna come out of the rear of the action, okay? You're gonna pull the bolt out, set it to the side, and of course our charging handle just fell right out. You notice that there's a couple of like little index points right here. That's gonna be important later when we go to reassemble the uh, rifle, but we're not gonna worry about that just yet. But here's your charging handle. And you can see that the charging handle actually sets against the, the gas key like this, and that's what you're pulling on. So there's a decent amount of, of tension that is put in an operational stance on this gas key. You can see that the screws that hold the gas key on are staked. Look how gnarly those things are staked. They're not meant to be taken off, right? They're meant to stay there. So unless there's some problem, like this breaks or shears or something like that, you're never going to worry about taking these two screws out. So any, any gun, not just the AR, but any gun you see that utilizes these types of stakings, you, you, you don't want to move that, okay? It's not meant to be moved. Of course, your charging handle has, you know, this recess on it, and there's a lot of modern charging handles that are set up to be ambi and all this sort of stuff. This is the OG standard charging handle, and we're going to go over some things you want to check out on that as well. You want to make sure this thing is not bent, cracked, messed up, any undue stress put on it. You know, you're obviously going to inspect every part. We're going to get to the bolt in a minute. We're going to kind of stay on the upper for a moment, but I do want to mention uh, now that we pulled this bolt out, you can see this is also a post-band bolt that has had the machine gun trip completely machined off the bottom of the carrier. So this is a neutered AR-15 carrier that even if you did have an auto sear uh, installed in the lower, uh, it would not trip with this bolt. Um, you know, and that's just a feature of this particular Colt. In some of the post-band uh, lowers that you see, you'll actually, and this is getting into some nerdy stuff that we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about, but I just wanna mention, sometimes you'll actually see these Colts with a huge plug put in right here. Like they'll machine this out, almost like in the same circumference as the safety uh, stud. This is the other side of the safety stud, see, okay? you'll actually see this area machined out and they'll, they'll drive like a nylon wedge in there. And what that does is that, that keeps it to where you cannot install an auto sear because it's basically removing the material that would be required to hold the auto sear. You know, you can't install an auto sear in a, a piece of polymer, right? So that was their idea by driving that nylon wedge in there, it would make it, it considerably more difficult to convert. Not my rules, it's just that's what they came up with. Luckily, we don't have to deal with this crap anymore. Let's get back to the upper. This is your forward assist. What the forward assist does, a lot of people, look, I, 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 look, I hate to discuss this in such simplistic terms, but a lot of people just don't know how things work. If you're gonna take care of your stuff, you have to know what the function is, like how it works. Look at these ridges on the side of the bolt. I mean, how many people take this gun apart and don't really even understand what that's for? right? The ridges are for the forward assist. So if the bolt does not go completely into battery, let's say that the gun's a little sluggish, it's dirty, whatever the case may be, and let's, let's say the bolt's out of battery. Well, there's no charging handle that I can, hit. like if an AK was out of battery, I could take my palm and maybe smack the bolt and, and, and shut it on home if I needed to. Like, but there's no real force that can be applied to this bolt directly, um, you know, using only like the, the, the T handle, the charging handle, right? But what the, what the forward assist does is gives me a point of leverage. I'm gonna cheat this bolt back a little bit. Let's pretend it's out of battery. Now, if I push the forward assist, there, there's actually a tit in there that pushes forward on those ridges. And look at this, it pushes the bolt forward to a hard lock. That's what that's for. So that's your forward assist. As long as your forward assist is working and it's not broken or anything like that, you know, there's not really a lot you need to worry about there, okay? If it works, you're good. Same thing with the dust cover. As long as the spring has got good tension and the dust cover works and the detent for the dust cover is nice and strong and it stays shut and doesn't pop open, you know, when you don't want it to, you're good. There's no need to take all this apart for field stripping. Same thing on the A2 with the upper, uh, with the front rear sight base, okay? This is actually a, a relatively complicated, <laughs> 
little contraption here and you don't want to take it apart unless something's broken, right? Period. Okay. And plus, you know, with your iron sights, if you've taken the time to zero them really well, you don't want to mess with your zero. So I would leave that alone and don't mess with it. So at this point, the upper is pretty much ready for us to undergo some maintenance, right? So we're ready to kind of check out the board, do some cleaning, and we're going to, we're going to break into this. So the kit that I'm using here is the bullseye box from Shooter's Choice, and it has a variety of different rods. And we're going to be using both the rifle rod and a section of the shotgun rod. A 12 gauge shotgun brush with this mop on it here is actually really good for getting into this upper and cleaning. It's a perfect shape to clean these raceways like this. Okay. We want to clean these raceways. See, this was a brand new mop. Look, we had a little bit of dirt. Now, of course, we're going to clean it more, but that's just to give you a basic demonstration of why I decided to go ahead and set the shotgun brush up. So just because a kit has, let's say you don't own a shotgun, but you buy the bullseye box. Well, if you, well for one, if you ever do uh, wind up buying a shotgun, you're going to have the necessary tools to keep it clean. And that's always good to be prepared. But two, the tools can also kind of lend themselves to different tasks, even if it's not designed for the particular item that you're working on. We're going to go ahead and just, uh, what, what I want to do is just, I'm going to look down and inspect the bore. Yeah, the bore's got a little bit of crud in there, but it's, it's not super dirty, but we obviously we're going to go ahead and clean it. You always want to clean your barrels from the rear forward. Now, there are some situations where, you know, you can't get around it and you'll have to clean from the muzzle to the rear. One example that comes to mind is the M1 Grand Service Rifle, which does not really lend itself to being cleaned from the rear. Also, the M14 does not lend itself super well from being cleaned from the rear. Although, I have seen some rifles that have, like, if I'm not mistaken, I'm thinking like the FN49, the old FN49, has a similar type of receiver that is, you know, it blocks the rear of the gun where you can't get a cleaning rod through the rear of the rifle to the front. But what they do is they'll actually put, there's a hole in the rear of the receiver so that your cleaning rod will clear that hole and then you can clean the gun from the rear. So all rifles should be clean from the rear. The, 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 they should travel in the direction that the bullet travels. Now there's, there's some points of contention that some people are probably gonna argue with me about, but I'm just gonna give you some of my experience on this. The, the first question that you're probably gonna have going through your mind is, well, if I clean this from the rear and I push the cleaning rod forward and then I pull the cleaning rod back out, okay, now is that a problem? I'm not cleaning from the rear at that point, I'm pulling it back through. Um, so this cleaning rod, has this articulating handle, all right? So if I pull the cleaning rod back through, and I'm not putting a lot of tension on this rod, the, the rod is going to be allowed to turn with the rifling as the brush is, is, is passing back over. I think the biggest issue with cleaning from the muzzle to the rear that you have to watch out for, and one reason that we push so hard that we wanna clean from the rear forward, is because you can damage the crown of the rifle uh, the, the, the crown is the area on the front of the barrel where the gases and the bullet escape last. Like, and the crown is super important. If you damage the crown, you're having a very inconsistent expansion of gases, which can really cause your accuracy to go absolutely to hell. All right. So you want to maintain the accuracy of the rifle. Like when we go to the civilian marksmanship program and we're picking out M1 Garands, they give you muzzle gauges so that you can check the muzzle wear. Because barrels, as they wear, they wear from the rear forward, the lead and chamber area forward where the rifling, uh, where the pressures and gases are the hottest, and they wear from the muzzle end rearward, in like this, right? From muzzle, from chamber, forward, towards the middle of the rifling. That's how they wear. So you don't want to accelerate that wear process by putting undue force and strain on the crown, especially with a metal cleaning rod, like a military cleaning rod, you notice that this rod is made out of brass. That's so it's non-marring. So the point that I'm making and what we're getting back to is that yes, I'm going to start from the rear, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull it back through too. It's, it's, I swear, it's gonna be okay, all right? <laughs> the gun gremlins are not gonna come get you in the middle of the night if you pull the rod back through. Now, if you're talking your, your, your fancy $10,000, uh, you know, match grade, <laughs> you know, fancy 
a bullseye gun or something like that, you know, you might want to employ a proper bore guide and really be super careful uh, about damaging that, you know, what, what is probably a, a, you know, a $1,200 or $1,400 barrel, right? So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and clean this bad boy. <laughs> Sorry, there's always a caveat that you have to put in there. It's never, never quite so simple, is it? We're going to be using some MC7 bore cleaner from Shooter's Choice. Now, I have a couple of different um, rods and things like that, and I've got some cleaning materials. So here's some of our Otis. Uh, these are the um, microfiber type cleaning cloths, right? They're, they're almost that same type of material like you see in the automotive industry that they use for like wiping down cars, like those uh, mops that you wipe down wet cars with to dry them off. It's almost that same type of material, like kind of a, I don't know, polyester or something, but Anyway, they're really great for this process. So I'm just gonna lay this down so we don't get a whole bunch of solvent and crap on our, um, on our bench, just to soak up the solvent. And we don't wanna, you know, get any of this stuff anywhere. So we're gonna go ahead and put some MC10 on this brush. This is a 22 caliber bore brush that is intended for this purpose. Now, again, this is important too. When you're done uh, administering what amount of bore cleaner you're gonna use, close it. <laughs> close this sucker because <laughs> what's going to happen is you're going to be walking around oops you're going to knock it over and <laughs> you're going to have solvent all over your bench and then you're going to go clean your sweet 16 browning a5 that's worth three grand and you're going to get a giant splotch where the where the bluing is going to be all nasty because you got bore cleaner all over your gun close it and remove it from the equation put it out of the way okay and it doesn't take much solvent we're going to go ahead and come in here from the rear give her a little shove Yep, a little dry, it's okay. All right, looks good. I'm gonna pull it back through. Yes, we're pulling it back through. I swear life's gonna go on. <laughs> All right, a couple of passes here. Not gonna take much. Now obviously, the more dirty the gun is, you know, the, the more you're gonna need to, to spend some time on this. All right. Yeah, this barrel was actually pretty freaking clean. I'll tell you what, we're gonna, um, now this is the other part. And so now when we put the solvent on this brush, now we, we've sort of contaminated this with solvent. We don't wanna cross contaminate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and pull this brush off that has solvent on it. I'm gonna take a rag and I'm gonna wipe the solvent off the rod, okay? We want to remove that solvent. We don't want any more solvent on there. Now, this is the part of the operation where I'm going to go ahead and put a patch puller on here, okay? Now, there's a couple of different ways to deal with patches. And what I mean by patches are these little cloth, you know, these are for cleaning, mopping out the, the, the rifle, okay? There's a couple of different options. You have mops, which are like, it looks like a little mop, kind of like the shotgun uh, mop that we showed you earlier. And that's for, you know, we could run a mop through it if we want, and that'll help soak up any uh, residual solvent. Solvent really, you know, solvents and cleaning materials do need to be given some time to work. So this is a point where we can probably just take a sip of coffee, you know, let that solvent, you know, we put a fair amount of solvent in the rifle. So we're going to let that solvent sit for five or so minutes or 10 minutes and let it do some work. Mm. Yep, coffee helps too. That's important lubricant for the human aspect of it. So we'll allow the solvent to sit a while. And what that solvent's gonna do, it's gonna help break up all of your powder residue as well as um, copper residue. So we'll spend some time talking about this. When a projectile is fired, you, you, you're generating some really, really, really <laughs> high pressures, okay? And the copper is a sacrificial material that not only is designed to allow the projectile to travel down the barrel at the speeds necessary that the powder is trying to push it, right? If you use a cast projectile, it's just going to shear the lead off and it, it wouldn't work. It's trying to put, you can't send a solid piece of lead down the barrel at the speeds that this thing is designed to do. So the copper serves as a sacrificial gilding component to allow the, 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 the pressures and speeds to be achieved. But it comes at a price, right? You do get copper residue that's left behind. The barrels are made out of a very, very tough material that, of course, no matter, you know, th th there is a barrel life, right? That copper will eventually 
begin to just wear the barrel down and you'll wear the rifling and lands and grooves down and the barrel will need to be replaced. Uh, but that's the way of the world and that's what we have to deal with. But you do get copper residue in your barrel. Little bits of copper shave themselves off from the projectiles and you wind up with copper residue in the barrel. The solvent, as it begins to work, will begin to attack that copper. And there's a lot of different products on the market that are meant to handle this type of uh, situation. But in this case, you know, our MC7, let's look at it, it says, removes copper, lead, and powder fouling. Also removes plastic shotgun wad fouling. Now we're not gonna get on that in this particular video, but again, with the solvent allowed to work, what will happen is, um, as copper oxidizes, it actually turns sort of a bluish green color, okay? When we push this patch out, we're gonna wait a few more minutes and just let that solvent kind of mellow. In fact, we're gonna take a break, and I'm gonna drink some coffee, and I may just put a little bit more solvent in there. I know we demonstrated the process, but I'm gonna soak a little more solvent in there. And then we're gonna allow, allow it to work, and when I push the patch out of the muzzle, you should see some bit of green or blue on it. And what that is, is oxidized copper that we have removed from the barrel. So let's allow some solvent to work for a bit and we're gonna go ahead and clean from the rear and let's push a patch through here. All right, we're gonna go ahead and uh, clean the chamber. So there's a variety of different tools that Otis makes for this purpose and Shooter's Choice as well. This is part of the Shooter's Choice bullseye box. But I wanna to mention too that Otis also has these MSR slash AR 556 kits. You know, I showed you that pouch earlier. I mean, a lot of you guys that were deployed, guys and gals, were probably issued these. In fact, some of y'all probably still have them rolling around in all of your kit at the house because, uh, you know, we didn't give these back to Uncle Sam. Uh, that's okay. I won't tell if you won't. You can see it has the bone tool and a variety of other things. And uh, this also has your pull cord, uh, your snake, if you will. So all of the components that we have in our bullseye box are in this particular kit as well. The only exception being the bone tool. Uh, as far as I can remember, the bone tool is not included in the bullseye box. You have to get the Otis kit to get the bone tool. We're gonna discuss that in a moment. All right, we're gonna clean the chamber. This is a chamber cleaning brush. So you can see that you've got this phosphor bronze section here that's on a braided cable. It's uh, very sharp, be careful, because especially these little uh, steel guys right here, they will pierce your flesh and can, can draw blood, so be careful. Uh, so the rear chamber extension or the barrel extension on the AR uh, has to have the recess to accept the locking lug. So if you look at this geometry here, we can see that this particular area, these, these kind of steel cables are designed to clean that recess really well, which you really want to make sure that recess is clean but honestly, I would say that what's more important to have clean in this situation is the chamber itself. A dirty chamber can really cause a lot of problems. You can get poor extraction, uh, you can get failures to feed. Uh, look, it's very important that your chamber is kept clean, okay? We're gonna go ahead and go in from the rear using our T-handle here from the Otis kit. We're gonna push in until it stops. You really just wanna push it in until uh, those uh, kind of steel bristles uh, get kind of like in line with the rear of the barrel extension. We're just going to give it a turn like this. And you could put some solvent on this if you want as well. I generally just run it dry. I mean, unless you're shooting a metric crap ton. That's about all you need is just a few turns with the chamber brush, okay? And of course, a quick inspection. That chamber looks nice and clean. Now we're gonna dry the barrel out as promised. Now, in the bullseye box, there's a variety of different patches I'm gonna show you that it comes with. What we call 22 caliber patches like these and 30 caliber or universal patches like these. You can see the difference in the size. That's about a two inch by two inch. If you're using a Jag, I'm just going over to the kit. This jag is designed to push patches through the barrel. This mop is designed to push through the barrel and soak up oils and solvents and other chemicals. A patch puller is a loop like this. Now, if you're using a puller, look, I'm, of, I'm old school. I prefer a patch puller because I like that 
I can put a larger patch on it and get it through a similarly sized barrel uh, without having any issues. I want a little bit bigger patch in this little 22 caliber patch that was included. So I'm just gonna cut about this much off. Just to give me, you can just see as a representative example, maybe about double the size, just to give me a little bit more surface area. And of course, this, this patch <laughs> that I cut off can still be used as a 22 patch, see? Or the small 22 patches can still be used with the Jag. And arguably, if you were cleaning like a 25 cal or maybe even a little six millimeter or something, that patch right there would probably be just fine. Probably even this one. But the nice thing about the larger patches, and see, I buy mostly large patches because a large patch I can turn into any patch I want. I can't make a small patch bigger, but I can make a big patch any size I want. So I guess that's just a point of contention. All right, let's do the same thing with the puller. All right, we're gonna push it through. This should go. Oh yeah. You want a tight fit, but not too tight. We're gonna push through. All right, now let's see if we were correct on our solvent. Now when I'm removing solvent from the barrel, it's important that you dry up all this solvent and get it out, okay? You can see here, there's kind of a blue color. That is copper that has been basically liquefied and cleaned from the barrel. It's, it's, it's really not a liquid version of copper. It, it's copper residue that has oxidized. So that color is actually oxidation. Copper turns blue when it oxidizes. Nerdy stuff, boys and girls. See, it, is, it, it was good to pay attention in science class, wasn't it? Now what we'll do while the, while the rod is in the forward position out the muzzle, we'll go ahead and pull a patch back through the other way. I know the rifle gods are going to frown upon me. That's okay. Okay, I'm going to make sure that that's... All right. What I like to do, um, as I'm pulling it through, it's going to start to kind of... It, it sort of forms against the crown a little bit, against the muzzle. While I've got it right there, give it a little turn like this. Secret squirrel stuff. You got to know the right people. <laughs> all right, I'm going to turn it like this. Now, when I push it all the way back through, let's see if there's any residue on it. Mm, yeah, a little bit of crud, right? But what that action just did was it made sure that we didn't have any crap up against the, the, the muzzle. You know, we want to keep that clean. Now, one thing about the, the muzzle device, you know, the flash hider, or the brake, rather, is that with this... Um, you know, it does protect the crown as well. So that's one nice thing about a rifle like this. You know, I can, I can bang this gun around. I can set this down against hard surfaces. I can stage it on something if I want and I'm not actually harming the crown of the barrel itself. I can't stress that enough, how important it is to have a good muzzle device that's nice and solid on an AR. Let's pull it back through and inspect some more. All right, that didn't require a lot of force at all. Pretty clean. Uh, we did a, a video on this rifle, I uh, think, <laughs> boys and girls, I think it was maybe a couple of years ago. <laughs> and I'll admit, uh, this gun has not been cleaned <laughs> since that video. I know you're going to scold me. You're like, well, Eric, if you're telling me to keep my rifle clean, you don't even keep your rifles clean. What the heck kind of teacher are you? Well, do as I say, not as I do. I don't care what anybody says, there's always going to be a dirty gun in the armory. I don't care how good of cleaning and maintenance you did, I will go in your armory and pull a rifle off of the rack and I will find some dirt. All right, that's pretty clean. You know, th this, this uh, gun was not very, very dirty. It was mainly just a little bit of, uh, of powder residue and a little bit of copper, but the barrel looks beautiful. Obviously, always inspect the barrel, you know? If it's dirty, clean it. <laughs> All right, I'll show you a little uh, hack here for getting a good bright light on uh, the barrel. Now we've discussed this in other videos, but I'm just gonna reiterate it. Grab yourself a patch. What we're gonna do, we're gonna make this easy on ourselves. We're gonna loosen the vice blocks. We're gonna turn this thing upside down just like this. And then chalk it back up like this. 
actually I probably shouldn't have pinched that right there. How about we do it right here? Okay, we're gonna turn it upside down like this. Take your patch, just stick it in the rear like that. Grab your, uh, your Surefire backup that Chad brought that I didn't have. Take your backup and put it on the low setting. Lay it right there. Go to the front of the rifle and look down. Oh yes. So what the patch does is it diffuses the light so it's not a super bright light. It, it just, it, you'd be surprised even the tiniest light or the lack of the flashlight period and just having the patch back there to help reflect the light that's available. I've got a pretty good view. Now if I was taking a photo or a video of the bore and I added that extra light, this just allows me some diffused light down the barrel where I can really get a good look. All right, I'm looking for nicks, I'm looking for scrapes, I'm looking for muzzle damage, I'm looking for, you know, to the best of my ability, I'm looking to see if there's any odd erosion on the, uh, the uh, actual gas port. And believe it or not, under good light, you can see the gas port. All right, we're gonna go ahead and take a moment to focus on the bolt assembly and the charging handle. Which, you know, it can be a daunting task at first if you're not used to it, but once you learn it, uh, it is totally not a big deal. And of course, again, we can see in better detail the cut on the carrier, you know, where they uh, relieve this so the auto sear won't, won't trip. But because of that cut, we also can see a little bit better demonstration of the way that the firing pin is retained because that cut is normally not there. They just passed over. You can actually see the way they just passed it on the, uh, on the machine. So that get, gives you a better representation. So you can see a pretty decent example. And as we get the bolt apart further, you're going you're gonna to be able to see this a lot better. But the gas forces are shot down into this gas key, the one that we told you not to remove. <laughs> Don't remove it. And then they are actuated against this bolt in here. It's pretty cool. So we're going to pull it apart. The first thing you want to do is you've got this uh, little pin right here, this cotter pin that retains the firing pin. You probably can't see super well. You might actually be able to see it. You see it holds it in place. There's a couple of different ways you can achieve that. Um, if we were to take, this is a, a dummy round, an action proving round. If we were in the field in a military environment and we didn't have any tools, we could use the nose of the round to push it out. And if you're lucky, you might even be able to use the nose of the round to pry that out like that. Okay. Now, if we have a cleaning kit like we have here, um, we can see you know, sometimes getting that guy back in is a little tricky. Now, in this case, we have the, the Otis kit. Now, if we didn't want to use a projectile, you know, we've got this little punch here we could use. Uh, of course, you can see I've already got the brush set up on our cleaning rod. But if we were to wanted to take, you know, this little punch and use it to push it out, we could totally just do that. Let's do that. All right. So... Use whatever tool, but pull the cotter pin out. All right. Invert the carrier to the rear like this. Give it a little smack. Your firing pin comes out. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take the bolt, push it to the rear to a hard stop. You're going to rotate this cam pin like that. We're going to take the bolt, turn it upside down. Once we've, we've, uh, move that cam pin to that location. And you'll also know it's in the correct position because it's actually not gonna come out any other way. So once you rotate it to this position, what I like to do is just take the bolt, don't hit the gas key hard, but just give it a little, little smack on the table and that cam pin will come right out. Now what that cam pin does is provide <laughs> camming action. <laughs> and what it does is as it is actuated against the carrier, it forces the bolt to rotate in this manner at this exact degree of tilt, okay? And that allows the bolt to lock forward into the barrel extension, locking the gun shut for the firing cycle, okay? So that cam pin is a pretty important component of this rifle. So once the cam pin is out, go ahead and pull the bolt just like I just did completely out, okay? The carrier is now stripped and ready to clean. We're going to set it off to the side again. You're not going to remove the gas key. It's staked for a reason. 
don't remove it. If it's broken or damaged, you're going to cross that bridge when you get there. Firing pin, firing pin, retaining cam pin, okay, all there. Now, uh, the bolt mechanism itself, now, or the bolt itself. What I like to do, and you can see the piston in which the gases operate towards, all right? Pretty interesting stuff, the way this gun works. It's pretty fascinating, okay? You have a gas seal that is formed on this piston cup with these gas rings. We are going to remove those. We, we will remove them. But we have our extractor, our ejector. We're going to check all this stuff. What I like to do is I take the firing pin. You're going to compress from the rear. Now, I don't know how well you can see this. I'm going to try to do it kind of slow. Maybe you can see. If I push the rear, see how it kind of lifts up? The front of the extractor is sort of lifting up a bit. What I'm doing is I'm compressing that plunger and I'm taking a good bit of force off of that pin so it should be easier to push out. So I'm going to sort of just give it a little push and then I'm going to take the firing pin and use it as a tool just like that. If you take the pressure off efficiently enough, you should be able to just grab it and pull it out with your fingers, although sometimes it may require a little bit of additional persuasion. In the field, we take the cotter pin and we'll push it in there like this and use it as a tool to push it out. That's just a little hack, so you don't have to worry about a tool, but don't lose that pin. Don't lose that pin. Don't lose any of these parts, okay? All right, the extractor looks good. This bolt's actually pretty clean. You really want to pay close attention to your extractor. This is probably one of the most common points of failure on an AR period are going to be your extractor wearing out. You'll begin to get some real sloppy extraction. You'll start experiencing more issues and you really want to pay attention to the wear of this component. Now, luckily extractors are cheap, <laughs> you know, so you should have quite a few of them on hand. You can see some brightening here. We can take our fingernail and kind of scrape that and we can feel, you know, it's pretty smooth. There's a little bit of wear, but for the most part, nothing to write home about. Um, but you really want to pay close attention to this part and make sure that you're not, you know, having any type of an issue. This spring should have a fair amount of tension, okay? If, it's, if this spring is wore out, you're going to get some real sloppy extraction. It's just, it's not going to extract properly. And here's the thing is, is guns give us little clues about what's going on as we use them, right? As, as some performance aspect of the gun begins to degrade, then you'll know that over time, hey, we need to look at certain components. You know, if the extractor is not, if the gun's not extracting properly, there's something in that extraction cycle that's not working. I think the culprit is usually gonna be the extractor being worn or this spring and plunger assembly being worn out. You can replace just this spring assembly if you want, of course. There's all these parts are available individually. But I think as reasonably priced as extractors are, everybody should have some spare extractors laying around. Everyone should have plenty of oops kits that have these small components, right? Because you are inevitably going to lose a small pin like this, especially in the field. And believe it or not, I think it's important for every rifle, especially an A2 that has a, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the accessory compartment on the A2. If you have an accessory compartment, I think everybody should have an extra cam pin in there too, because these do break, okay? Things break. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna, we're gonna show off the bone tool. This, this is another component that I think is a really important thing for every AR shooter to have in their inventory is the 5.56 Otis bone tool. And I'm gonna show you how this is used and it's gonna make your life a heck of a lot easier. First, we're gonna take the, the gas rings out. Now I want to discuss the position of these gas rings. They do need to be staggered. And this you'll notice that there's slots in the gas rings, okay? And those slots are mainly so that you can separate the gas rings and remove them from the gas piston assembly. This is a piston. I mean, forget that it's a gun part. <laughs> That's a piston all day long, right? All right, so we talk about direct gas impingement. Well, what is that gas impinging against? A piston. So it is a hybrid piston system, right? But this piston can get a lot of fallout and crud on it. Now this one's not super dirty, but we are gonna show you how to get that clean with the bone tool. And we're gonna pull these gas rings off. 
We can pull the gas rings off, but you know, considering that this is a field strip video, why don't we leave them in place and just correct the gap? So if you look at your gas rings and you see that there's a little gap in each one of them, all right, if that gap overlaps another gap, you need to separate that gap as far as you possibly can, okay? So that means that there's three of these gas rings. You want one gap to be, let's just say, about right here. Well, where would we want the second gap in the middle gas ring to be? We don't want it to be close to that gap because as the gun is operating and, and cycling back and forth and moving and jostling around and things like that, um, if those gaps intersect with each other, you're gonna lose gas pressure. And look, just like losing compression in an engine, it's gonna rob the performance and the gun could short stroke and things like that. Now there's a couple of uh, fixes that people have come up with over the years for this. Uh, one is CMMG sells a continuous gas ring. It is one assembly that can still be sort of threaded on um, and everything like that, but uh, you will never have that gap issue. But considering this is an old school A2, uh, it still retains the original gas ring setup. So I can see here that the gas rings are staggered quite well, and it would take a heck of a lot of jostling around to get those gaps to line up with each other and cause the gas pressure uh, to be greatly reduced to the point where the gun will short stroke. So that's just something I wanna mention on that. I'm not gonna pull the gas rings out for this because for everyday cleaning, you don't need to. The bone tool has a scraper on the end. We're gonna put it in here. We're gonna scrape it. Look at that. Look at all that chunk, that, that uh, caked on carbon. Right, that's all gas assembly, like caked on carbon that is hardened. Carbon, it's, I mean, it is organic, <laughs> which is kind of one of the strange things about it, you know. You could really almost call it like a, almost like a plant byproduct in a way, like this carbon as it hardens and, and forms this, this nasty crud, right? As powder burns, you know, it's, it, it, gunpowder is a really weird thing when you think about smokeless powder and its residues that are left behind. Pretty neat stuff. All right, so you can see the bone tool is doing its job. And of course, we could, we can take this guy and just kind of wipe it down and look at all that dirt and carbon and things. You just want the, you just want this piston cup to be as smooth as possible and you don't want a whole lot of buildup and grime on it, all right? There's another reason that a lot of the Otis kits and the Shooter's Choice kits come with pipe cleaners, because for ARs, pipe cleaners are, are pretty, pretty important, pretty indispensable thing. I'll go ahead and get some of these long Q-tips too. We'll probably use a few of those, just for demonstrative purposes. Okay. <clears throat> There's really about no other way to clean an AR bolt properly unless you use pipe cleaners, okay? So the pipe cleaner can get down in here and that cleans this firing pin channel out, and also this really critical area. And, and really, I, actually I take that back, it's not super critical. You just wanna make sure that there's not a whole lot of gas and gunk buildup uh, in this firing pin channel, anything that can in inhibit uh, the movement of your firing pin, which, you know, it would take a lot of crud to do that. But, you know, you just wanna take uh, some time to clean that. And of course, be careful with your pipe cleaner that you don't get a bunch of crud in the channel like what we just did right there. That's okay, just wanna make close attention. And if you do happen to get a little crud in there, you can just take your uh, air compressor and just blow it out. Like that, easy, okay? Now the bone tool also has another area on it that is designed for the carrier. Again, you see another scraper right here. So you had the scraper for the, pist the, the piston cup on the bolt and then you have the scraper for where the bolt goes in like this. So we're gonna go ahead and scrape that. Not quite as much crap gets in that area, but the point of the scraper is definitely to make sure that you don't get, there's not, not a lot in there, but that's what that scraper's for. And then last but not least, there's also a scraper component for on the bone tool uh, for the firing pin. Okay, so the firing pin goes right here. 
And sometimes you can get, in fact, if you look there, there's a pretty good little bit of crud right there, right? Put this in here, give it a little turn, and that helps scrape the crap off of the rear of the firing pin. Okay. This little guy right here is threaded so that the bone tool can also be used as a handle with your Otis cleaning kit. So that's a nice touch that they added there was that, was that threaded boss because that does make one gnarly handle uh, to use for your cleaning rods and things like that. But that's a great accessory. I, that's something I recommend every AR shooter to have. And yeah, you know, at first I thought, well, how useful could this really be? But the first, you know, like dozen or so times I use it, I'm like, wow, this really does take a lot of grunt work um, out of cleaning your bolt, especially in the field. All right, so we've, we've shown off the bone tool, but obviously there, there's tons of cracks and crevices in this whole assembly um, that will require you to kind of wipe down and clean, and that's where the Q-tips come in handy. You can just take a little bit of FP-10. Um, this is FP-10 that came uh, with the bullseye box, and it has these little needle oilers on there. So the needle oilers are nice because you can put the oil exactly where you want, so for applying oil, that's really what these are more for, but I like the needle oilers because it allows me to make sure I'm not using too much oil and it allows me to not waste product. So I can make the oil go a lot further by only using exactly what I need and putting it exactly where I want. It may not matter to some of you, but you know sometimes it's just important to consider that. We'll take a little oil on this Q-tip. And again, like anywhere dirt and crap and, and things can find their way, you can use the, the Q-tip to uh, clean these recesses. Now there are various mops and tools and accessories uh, that they make for cleaning uh, this types of stuff, you know, all different types of specialized AR accessories, but sometimes just a little old fashioned elbow grease and attention uh, is merited, okay? We're gonna switch to this other scraper that comes with this kit. It's basically just a, you know, tool steel leaf spring with a hardened scraper on it like that. And we can take that scraper and get in there and really check that bolt face. You just, you don't want anything interfering with the operation of this rifle, right? So we could take that scraper and just really scrape any and every little area that might have some crap down in there. You know, just kind of go through and inspect and check and clean it the best you can. All right, if we've got a bunch of hardened crud in between the locking lugs, the scraper can fit in between the locking lugs. So that's helpful. And of course, we already saw like the little tiny uh, punch here, and here's an actual punch assembly. If you need to you know, push various uh, components out, you can do that. Uh, here is a screwdriver blade that can also double as a scraper. If you've got some really hardened crap that you gotta scrape off, that's why it's brass, okay? So that you're not gonna mar or damage your components. And again, we also have a brush assembly. We've got a couple of brushes we'll show you. So this brush here, it's just nylon. So we can get in there and just, that's actually doing a pretty good job. There was a little bit of crud on the inside of this carrier and that brush is just cleaning it right out of there. And the brushes are really more for like dirt and dust. Like the last thing you wanna do is go throw in like a whole bunch of uh, oil and everything on <laughs> a bolt or a carrier that's got dust and dirt all over it. All you're gonna do is just get that dirt to stay there. So the brushes are good for that. So that's just kind of a demonstrative idea there to show you that like this little kit includes all your little accoutrements and, and whatnot. And then of course in that kit, there's also this dirt brush, which is kind of cool. It's like a lipstick case with a, a brush. So if you got, you know, you can, these are really, the brushes are really handy for the lowers they end up getting a lot of crap down in there, but you may not want to, you, you may not have some compressed air to blow it out, or you may not have the ability to get down, down in there and clean in the little cracks and nooks and crannies and things. The brushes are good for that. So that's a useful component. And that's small enough to throw in your kit, you know, and have along with your bone tool. In fact, this guy would probably fit in the uh, buttstock accessory on, uh, comp uh, compartment on the A2. So this is just to demonstrate some of the, the cleaning areas and also on the carrier, something we really want to pay some decent attention to, very decent attention to, is this actual gas key here, right? You take your, um, yeah, look at that, look at all that. Put your, your uh, uh, Q-tip in there, push it down to a hard stop, give it a good turn, 
run it a couple of times until the Q-tips come out clean. I wouldn't oil it or do anything crazy, but you know, definitely get in there and clean that really well. Now, one thing you can notice about these carriers that, that I think is, is pretty important to think about is that this area in here is chrome lined, all right? That's good for cleaning, right? Notice the chrome lining? So that is made so that all of the dirt and debris, not only does this thing stay really slick in here, but it also makes it easier uh, for cleaning. And then we can even see on this carrier, there's a C stamped on the side, and I'm assuming that would mean chrome line, just like it does on the barrel, right? This gun has a chrome line barrel, and it makes cleaning easier, okay? It's very hard, that chrome, okay? Look here, see, there's a, there's a C stamped on there. It's a chrome line barrel. Just something to consider. But we're also gonna get in here and clean this too. Now again, with the universal cleaning kit, we can just go over here and grab a brush that fits pretty good. Let's try, tell you what, let's try a 45 ACP cleaning brush. Look at that. We're gonna get in there and just scrub this out really well, okay? And because it's chrome line, it's not gonna give us really a whole heck of a lot of issues. Just gonna get in there and kind of break up some of that crud. Nice and smooth looking there. And again, just like we used that 45 brush, like again, earlier we used the shotgun brush, right, for that other purpose. We're gonna use the 45 mop for the same thing. I'm gonna thread that on there, but this time we're just gonna soak up any crap that might be there. Just like this. Look at all that dirt that we got out of there. You don't have to use solvent on the, uh, the bolt if you don't want to. Just depends how dirty it is. Um, I'd probably avoid putting too much solvent on it if you don't have to, right? You know, clean it as much as it needs to be cleaned. We're gonna look at it. That looks nice. There is a little bit of crud in that firing pin channel in there that we had some difficulty getting to but I think we can probably just uh, go ahead and get in there with another bore brush. This time, let's try, <laughs> let's try the 25 caliber rifle bore brush and see if it fits that firing pin channel nice and tight. All right, we're gonna come in from the front. Oh, <laughs> it fits perfect. All right, we're just gonna work that back and forth. All right, and without moving the bolt, I'm gonna slam it down right here. We'll see if anything comes out. See that? Gets you to fail inspection right there. Get that bone tool in there. I think you guys get the idea. Make sure that this area in here is nice and clean. Make sure your gas key is really clean. Make sure that the cam surface in the carrier is not galled or messed up or, or, or you know, have any type of deformation. As you see, there's a pretty unique cut that is made on this carrier, and you wanna make sure it's not galled or messed up, anything that could rob performance, right? You're looking for splits and cracks and damage, galling, wear, all of those things, right, are very important to consider. I'm gonna take all of these components, and I think what we'll go ahead and do before we go to the lower, because there's not really a heck of a lot we're gonna talk about on the lower, just a few points uh, that we want to look at. I guess we can just go ahead and put this bolt back together now since we're, we're already right here together here. Um, we're going to go ahead and go in the, in the reverse order and we're going to, and putting it back together honestly is, is a heck of a lot easier. We're going to take our extractor and place it back in here. Okay, just like this. Take this uh, hardened pin. Again, applying a little bit of pressure. I'm pushing down with my thumb. I'm gonna apply some pressure and start the pin. Now, when you're applying that pressure, let me pull it back out. When you're applying that pressure and the pin may not wanna start, take your thumb and push back and forth. Look, I'm just gonna exaggerate the movement. See how I'm pushing back and forth with my thumb? Work it down and back and forth like this as you're pushing it in, and that'll help you find the, find the spot. Now, you don't want the pin to protrude any extreme direction in either way, so just Look at both sides where the pin's coming out and just visually inspect and make sure that the, that the distance is about equal. 
you don't want it to push out on the side, on either side really well. That, that's, that's not going to be good. Now, once this uh, bolt is back in the carrier, you don't really have to worry about that pin finding its way out. But before you put it in, you don't want to scratch or gall any of those surfaces by having the pin uh, sticking out, you know, in any kind of an extreme direction. Again, before we put this bolt back into the carrier, we also want to inspect our gas key location. And we saw as we were handling this bolt, sure enough, those gas keys uh, found themselves, or the gas uh, rings found themselves out of alignment. Now, if I just put this back together haphazardly and didn't think about it, those could find them, their, themselves uh, getting close to each other and give us a little bit of a robbing of performance. So we're going to take a moment to just double check the position of those gas rings and make sure that the gaps are not overlapped. In my opinion, my humble opinion, this is one of the only real shortcomings of this design is, is that if the end user does not take the time to properly clean and line up everything like it's supposed to be and really inspect the system properly, uh, honestly, this is probably one of the weakest points of the system right here. Now, in modern times, that looks good. That's, that's what we want. In modern times with the continuous gas rings, uh, that's pretty much going to make it a non-issue, but just for those of you, I mean, look, a lot of the lesser price ARs and things like that, they do use this old school, uh, you know, assembly. So that's just something to consider. A lot of people get confused on which direction to put the bolt back in. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, it's quite simple. Wh which direction does the gun extract? <laughs> it extracts to the right, correct? Well, if we know the bolt goes in this direction, then we know the extractor needs to face in that direction. But what they did also for you is they have this hole that's a nice clean hole. If you turn around the other side, you notice these divots. All right, if memory serves, look at that. Those divots are there. We cannot even put this gun together the wrong way, even if we wanted to. So you're gonna quickly see that those divots are there to prevent this pin from being inserted in the wrong direction. So don't worry about putting the gun back together wrong because you can't. Now, when you go to put it back in, make sure the extractor is facing to the right. And you're gonna wanna generally kind of wiggle a little bit to get those gas rings to kind of line up and force themselves back into that assembly. But before you do, what I would do is have the, the bolt right here and you got those gas rings showing through the cam pin slot, take your FP10 oiler, just, 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 just throw a little half a drop of oil on there. And once you get that, those rings to settle, go ahead and give it a turn like this, just to, ooh, man, look at, Look how good that rotates. Just for having that little bit of oil in place made such a difference. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna take the extractor, point it to the right, and you're gonna push it home until you see the hole in the bolt line up with the cam slot uh, in the carrier, okay? Now, the nice thing about the, the cam pin is it can't be put in wrong either way. So it's like, it doesn't matter which direction you put it in as long as it's in the correct orientation. This is the orientation that the cam pin goes in and comes out where I'm holding it, right? Not like that, like this. So we're gonna put it in there. And, and also, if you notice, the orientation of the hole in the cam pin that the firing pin goes through. All right, so let's, let's pretend the firing pin's in there, all right, and the cam position's in this, this position. Well, the firing pin couldn't go through the cam pin there. Once it's rotated back into place, that then allows the hole under which the, uh, the firing pin goes through the bolt, okay? So we're gonna, again, line it up, put the cam pin back in place like this, give it a rotation, like that. We're gonna cheat the bolt forward. And that's one way you can check your gas, uh, gas key, your gas rings too. Uh, you wanna make sure that this moves real easy and I'm gonna show you how to do that in a moment. Now, to get the firing pin in, what you want to do, you don't want to push down like that against the table because now what you've done is you've, you've pushed the bolt back and the firing pin is not going to really line up that great. Push it forward, hold it like this. Well, we're kind of cheating here because this slot is here. There's, there's, there's a whole big area that you can just drop it in just like that, uh, which is sort of cheating. But if you have a traditional carrier that still has the trip and all of this extra geometry, what I do, just cup your hand around it like this and just drop it in. Look at that, fell right into place, okay? 
Take your thumb, place it like this against the back, holding the firing pin forward, or any finger, if you will. It doesn't have to have a lot of pressure, but make sure the firing pin is forward. You notice this cam, this uh, cotter pin here, has a split in it, so it's like it, it kind of puts some tension on the outside of the of the pin. And over time, uh, th these cotter pins will wear out, and they will begin to eventually lose their ability to hold the firing pin in very efficiently. It takes a long time for them to wear out. But this is another consumable component that you, you probably want to have an oops kit or two with a few of these. I, I'd have a half a dozen or so on hand just so you don't have to worry about it. Because sometimes these things can be a little bit of a bear to get in. And, and a lot of times what you end up having to do is take a, uh, a, a set of pliers sometimes and you'll have, to, you'll have to occasionally compress this guy like this. You can see that gap closing. Now normally, you really shouldn't have to do that, but on, on one that's in really good condition and it's, it's real new and real stiff, uh, it can be a little bit difficult to compress with just your fingers. On this, what I would do, start it at an angle like this. I know this is a little difficult to see. Start it at an angle. You notice how when I take my thumb and push it, it compresses? Start it at an angle and compress it and push it in. Look, it's that easy, okay? It ain't rocket science. If people make, a, make it into rocket science when it isn't. Now one last thing we'll check before we assemble. We're gonna lubricate when the gun is assembled and I'm gonna explain why when we do it. We're gonna push the bolt to the rear and I'm just gonna off camera, I'm gonna give it a little flick. Look, I can do it on camera. See how easy that is? Just a flick of the wrist. And that bolt moves without very much undue stress or issue. That's properly um, put together and, uh, and we're good to go. Now on the charging handle, just very quickly, look, there's not a lot that can go wrong here, but I'll just kind of reiterate. You're looking for galling, splits, breaks, tear, anything that could indicate to you that the charging handle has any kind of wear. About the only thing that you really have to worry about on the charging handle is really just the latch. That's about, as long as you don't damage it or, or do anything too stupid, the only thing that can really wear out on this thing is eventually the spring can wear out, but boy does, <laughs> I, in all the years I've been shooting ARs, uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you, I've hardly ever seen this spring wear out. You will occasionally see this latch gall really bad, but honestly, the receiver galls before the latch does. But we're gonna go over that when we reassemble it and lubricate it. That's pretty much it for the uh, charging handle and the bolt carrier assembly and all that. That's probably, honestly, for maintenance, this is probably the area that you're gonna pay the closest attention to to keep this thing running properly. Um, the bolt being improperly cleaned and maintained and lubricated is probably gonna be the, and the extractor. Uh, those, are, those are probably the areas where this gun is gonna fail the most, is if you do not take the time to properly clean that, that piston okay, with this bone tool. So that, again, pretty important to have. All right, we're gonna move a few tools out of the way. I mean, we went through a few pipe cleaners and uh, Q-tips and things. Um, pretty important stuff to have laying around, okay? We're gonna go ahead and move to the lower. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the lower, but there's just a few things that I kinda wanna mention. All right, for one, the minute I picked this up, I, I took my A2 stock and, and grabbed the receiver. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a turn. I can feel, you can't feel it, but I can. The stock is a little bit loose. We're gonna go ahead and correct that right now. Luckily on the A2, it's literally just this bolt right here in the rear of the stock, okay? I'm gonna grab the same screwdriver that I used earlier to break that Chicago screw and I'm just gonna I'm gonna tighten this bolt right here. Yep, it's a little loose. You know what? I wonder if that thing, well, look, this is a good opportunity to uh, go ahead and <laughs> let's check out the accessory compartment since we need to dig a little deeper here. All right, let's see what I have in here. And I swear this wasn't planned, but here we are. Okay. 
forensic. Ah, <laughs> uh, we have a bone tool. We have some ALG Go Juice that looks like it's kind of hardened up, but it probably could still use it. We have a chamber brush, and we have an Otis microfiber gun cleaning cloth, and an old school <laughs> mill spec cleaning kit, just like uh, just like Uncle Sam intended. All right, look for field cleaning. This is more than adequate. So the A2 does have a storage compartment, which is nice. That stock does feel a little bit loose. I probably have to pull the butt plate off and get up under on that tube and give her just a little bit of a tighten. We're not gonna worry about that right this moment. All right, again, on the lower, we're not gonna spend a lot of time here because there's not really a heck of a lot that can go wrong. This is mainly just a point of inspection. We wanna make sure that everything that has spring tension on it, that the springs aren't worn out. That includes our magazine release. All right, we'll make sure that spring's nice and stout. That feels good. That spring is nice and stout. Of course, because this uses a Chicago screw uh, up front, we don't have to worry about this plunger uh, uh, retaining pin and everything like that. Um, but obviously check to make sure that's got plenty of power. Our rear takedown pin, Nice and nice and tough, that's looking good. All right, you've got another plunger that retains the buffer and spring. We're gonna go ahead and pull that out. And look, we're not gonna get fancy here. We're gonna use our dummy round. And uh, you're gonna push down with the dummy round, and this also allows you to keep your, uh, your fingers out of the way. Look at that, and that comes out. Push the hammer down. There's your buffer and spring. Now these are all specific to each gun design, like, you know, carbine, pistol. I mean, there's all different types of buffers and, and things like different weights of buffers. This is just an old school Colt <laughs> with a standard rifle assembly. Now, um, there's not a heck of a lot here to report. I mean, obviously just clean it and wipe it down, but there is one little hack on this particular thing. Like you notice when you're shooting an AR and, um, you 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 hear a bit of action noise when you're shooting it. You hear like a thong going, you know, like a like a bonging kind of sound or a ringing kind of sound. Uh, there are ways you can sort of escape that a little bit. You can you can actually put some light grease on this, uh, some luber plate or uh, some grease, you know, whatever. You know, kind of grease it up a little bit. Don't get crazy, but you don't really have to worry a ton about a lot of crap getting into this component. So it's not like you're gonna get sand or dirt in here. I mean, it's a pretty closed system. Again, being an AR, um, I will take my grease pin and just grease this thing down a little bit. Um, again, some luber plate would probably be good. And something else I wanna mention about the lower, that's kinda cool. A lot of people may not know this about an A2, but if you look at the screw, all right, that holds uh, the stock onto the buffer tube assembly. It's kind of hard to see, but it's hollow. It's got a hole in it. So that means that if you get this thing in water and the whole gun is full of water, all you have to do is just hold it upside down like this, it'll drain. A lot of people don't know that, that that's a drain hole in case you get the gun full of water. They really did think of everything. <laughs> I mean, look, there's a reason the AR is awesome and that's one reason. I'll loop this up later, but I just want to mention that about the, uh, the buffer and the spring. Lubricate it with some grease or something, and throw it back in there and move on with life. Wipe it down with a rag. Now, on the lower, this is probably one of the most important points I, I could probably think of is you know, keeping that trigger lubricated. You know, there's a lot of moving parts in this trigger assembly. You know, we can control. Don't allow that hammer to just drop, okay? on your bolt stop. Because that bolt stop's already, it's doing a lot of work already. And on the lower, that's probably one area that you're gonna probably see break more often than anything else. You know, th these things do snap off from time to time. So be careful jostling this thing around. I mean, like, use it as a tool, but think about it. When you shoot the last round out of the magazine and the magazine follower pushes up on this tab right here, and then that bolt comes to a hard stop on that stop. That's what it's for, it's a bolt stop. You're putting a lot of pressure on that bad boy from time to time. So just keep that in mind. You know, it might not be a bad idea to have a few extra bolt stops laying around because it is a component that will break over time and you don't want to add to that wear by allowing that hammer to smack. So if you are gonna do function tests and things like that, 
and do it like I'm doing right here with the lower off of the gun, just control the hammer and inspect and look at everything. You know, if I, if, if the, if I squeeze the trigger, pull the hammer to the rear and then let go and it's locked in the rear position, watch this hammer as I release the trigger. It's going to move up just a little bit. Okay, and that's a series setting. But you want to really lubricate all this stuff pretty well. Let me grab this grease pin, which I happen to have right here. All right, all weather firearm grease. Let's check it out. Here's our grease pin. We're going to go through and, and grease this up. Now, there's a lot of different types of grease, but basically, if you look at, you know, really just about any standard AR trigger, you're going to see some polished components uh, that are, you know, let's just say for, for lack of better term, surface ground or, or fitted, rather, where you'll see some of the coatings kind of wore off. One is on the back of the hammer right here. You want to give this a squeeze. Oh, I have a feeling this is going to get gutsy here. Let me just give it a little squeeze. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right, we're going to put some grease on the back of there. And of course, that's, that's going to intersect here with the disconnector, but we'll, or the, uh, the, the sear, we'll put a little, we'll put a little bit on there too. And also on the rear of the hammer, there's a stud right here. You can see that, that intersects against the, the front of the trigger bar, okay? You want to keep that lubed up. And of course, I'm getting freaking grease everywhere because I'm trying to explain and film and all that stuff. But it's right there. And look, you can, you can go full ham. It's not going to hurt to put a little grease on there. Don't get crazy, but put some grease on it. Yep. So the rear stud on the hammer, the bottom of the hammer that intersects with the trigger bar. All right, we're feeling, we're feeling the tension of our springs. Make sure everything's got some tension. That feels good. And what I like to do as well, you know, mm, see this wear mark right here? There's a little bit of wear. This is where the carrier, <clears throat> you can see this kind of cut on the bottom of the carrier that sort of slides across. All right, now I'm not going to shoot this bolt across the room but I can demonstrate to you. When this bolt <clears throat> goes to the rear, that, that kind of convex cut that's in the bolt of the carrier pushes the hammer down to allow it to catch again, okay? And that creates a wear component. See that wear? I would say go ahead and, go ahead and take a little grease. Not a lot, but go ahead and grease that hammer a little bit. Just like that. <clears throat> it looks good. We'll go ahead and put just, I mean, literally just the residual grease that's on the tip of this thing on this takedown pin so it can slide nice and easy. You don't want it to wear too, oh, excuse me. <laughs> you don't want it to wear too much against, uh, against that stud that's in there. That, that goes, the stock holds the spring and retaining plunger in from the rear of the receiver that retains this pin, okay? You want to keep it lubricated so it's just easy to pull in and out, okay? Gosh, boys and girls, I think honestly that, I mean, other than wiping it down and cleaning any obvious signs of dirt and, 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 and debris and nasty stuff, I mean, that's really about it, you know? Clean this, uh, Magwell out. You definitely don't want to get all the dirt and crap out of there. I don't really spend a lot of time worrying too much about the lower. Uh, one thing that I would probably pay, uh, you know, a little bit closer attention to as well would be that in a gun that gets really, 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 really dirty with a whole lot of crud in it, you can get lots of unburned powder in this area here. The reason I didn't really worry about it too much is because this thing actually is like pretty clean. So there's not a, a heck of a lot to worry about, but you can get it down in there with Q-tips and with pipe cleaners and clean all that crud out of there. You can use compressed air. Uh, you can use your brush to get in there and clean anything. So th there's lots of tools at your disposal for getting that area nice and clean if you need to. But those are the areas that I would probably spend uh, the most time, you know, greasing up really well and getting lubed up and everything like that.
All right, we're gonna go ahead and reset that hammer and put the lower on safe. About the only other thing that I would probably just kind of pay some close attention to on the AR um, would also be uh, the trigger pins themselves. You wanna inspect uh, the actual springs, right? So there are cuts in these trigger pins that those spring legs are meant to sit on. Just make sure they haven't become dislodged or, or anything like that and that they won't allow the trigger pins to, to, to come out very easily, okay? And it's also worth noting that the pins on the Colts are a specific size. So if you ever do have to replace these, especially this particular one, uh, these are a little bit larger diameter pin uh, than what all the modern ARs use. Um, it's, I, don't, I don't remember the exact measurement, but it is a bigger pin. You can see, it's definitely a bigger pin. The only other area I would uh, pay some close attention to, take the grip, grab the gun in your hand, take the grip, give it a twist. Does it move? Okay. <laughs> if it doesn't, you're good. It needs to be tight. Check that grip and make sure it's tight. If not, obviously you can see, uh, maybe, <laughs> there's a screw in there. Just take a screwdriver of the appropriate size and tighten it up. Why would the grip be in loose matter? Well, the reason is because the grip actually houses the spring and plunger that powers your safety. So if that grip is loose, you know, that could obviously, not only do you not want the grip being loose because you don't want it loose when you're trying to shoot it, but if it got too loose, that could potentially cause your safety to not only fail to function, but potentially even fall out of the gun. <laughs> so you don't want that. That's pretty much it for the lower. We're gonna go ahead and put the gun back together and do a functions test, and I'm gonna show you some lubrication points uh, that I would probably consider checking out. So uh, that's pretty much it for that. Let's get it back together. All right, so remember when I said that the handguards are gonna be a real bear to get on and off? Well, this is the part that's the most bearish, but we're gonna go ahead and do it anyway. All right, again, we're just gonna check this real quick. Oh, we did have a little bit of crud in there, but you know, this is a pretty good handguard design. It's, it's held up pretty well. You know, it dissipates heat pretty well. And in, in our meltdown videos, <laughs> we've seen that given enough heat, <laughs> these handguards will catch on fire. So just keep that in mind. But boy, you really would have to get this sucker hot to do that. So I don't think many of you are gonna have to worry about that problem because you're not uh, mad lads like Chad and I. Go ahead and you can see that, you know, there's some little slots up front right here. And uh, again, I think we can both agree that the upper and lower are precisely the same. That makes logistics really easy. To prove the point, I'm gonna take the worn section that was on top and put it on the bottom, because we can. Kind of come in at an angle like this, and kind of work that guard in, all right? It'll, it'll set in place like that. Pull down on the D-ring. See right here, look, look at my thumb. I'm gonna pull. You don't have to smack on it and hit on it and all that sort of mess. We're gonna turn it around. One last inspection just to make sure everything looks nice. Looks good to me. Again, the upper handguard back in place. It'll kind of find its way. Okay. The D-ring does not need to be compressed all the way all the way down when you're putting the top handguard back on. Compress the D-ring, but kind of favor towards the top and leave that bottom like this. See how it'll, it will articulate? See that movement? It articulates a little bit. Put the majority of your, of your tension on the top end of the D-ring like this. And I find the best way to do it is to hold it like this, close the dust cover so you can get your hand in nice and flat. Break out your man mitts. Look, that wasn't that hard, was it? Everybody was so worried about it. It's only intimidating if you allow it to be. Too easy. We're gonna put the bolt back in. You notice, because of the genius of Eugene Stoner and the genius of uh, Colt and all those people, that if we take this upper and invert it, that the charging handle and the front sight assembly actually allows it to lay pretty flat, right? And one of the cool things about that when you think about it too, is our front sight post protects our front sight. It's just a well thought out design. Like, sorry, I just don't know any other way to put it. Look at that. It's like, it just wants to be put back together. <laughs> put the rifle uh, upper on, it, on its 
on its uh, back like this. Remember what we did earlier with the bolt? Push forward. All right, you want this bolt to be out. If it's in like this, you, you're not, you're not going to be able to get it into the upper, okay? Make sure the bolt is out in the outmost position. Remember those uh, little notches on the charging handle you can see right here where my finger is? You're going to place the charging handle in there and you'll see some cuts in the upper that those little slots are designed to go into. That's just designed to get the charging handle back in place. And again, this is actually a great way to show you. <laughs> see that gas tube that's coming out, what we talked about earlier, that you want to check for all that galling and wear? Look at that. You can see how it intercepts in there, okay? Really cool stuff. And this is probably a good uh, moment to kind of discuss the wear on this area too. You can see on the upper, as we put the charger handle back in place, you can see some brightening right there on this receiver where that, uh, look, I'm gonna push forward and watch this, watch this guy right here. Watch what it does, right? That just retains the charging handle in place because once the gun is in battery and ready to shoot, the firing cycle is gonna happen 30 or 20 times or how many rounds is in the magazine and this charging handle is just gonna stay forward like this. So that, that not latch is pretty important for it to be in good shape and have good tension on it so that charging handle doesn't walk out on you. You definitely don't want that. But again, let's take our grease pin <clears throat> we're going to take our grease pin. Now, we're not going to get crazy, boys and girls, but we're going to put, let's put a little bit of grease right there. Just a bit. Just a, just a scotch. That's probably more than a scotch, but you know what? I think Eugene Stoner will forgive me. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So again, we'll put it back on its back, pull the charging handle out about halfway. Again, making sure the bolt is forward, not like this, but like this, out. And you'll know the cam pin will be the most forward. Take the bolt, turn it up on its back like this, lay, <clears throat> lay the gas key in the recess of the charging handle line the carrier up with the opening in the in the receiver push the whole assembly home just like that that was actually a good demonstration of that uh dust cover popping open okay we actually had the dust cover closed and then when we pushed the bolt home it opened it on up all right real easy stuff we'll work this back and forth a few times check it out all right bolt locks in place real nice all of that looks good now, the grease that we put on the hammer surface is going to lubricate this, so we don't need to worry about putting more grease on that. There's already enough grease on the hammer. We're going to go ahead and assemble the rest of the gun here. All right, again, if this was any other AR, it would have a self-retained forward pin. I don't think I need to bore you guys with the details. I'm going to go ahead and put the upper back on to the lower. We'll go ahead and push this rear pin home. Now, obviously, on any modern AR, you would have, again, a self-retained pin, but this pin comes out because this is a post-ban Colt, okay? So we're just going to pretend that this isn't, <laughs> that this isn't, um, you know, <laughs> a, 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 a ban Colt, all right? So let me get this pin back in. You guys get the idea. You may have to... Persuade it, just like I persuaded the camera just then. All right. Mallets are good. <laughs> Sorry, I bumped the camera. <laughs> All right, again, we're just going to put this screw back in. I feel like I must reiterate that this is not something you're going to have to do on all the modern ARs. It's just because this is an old school one, okay? Do not <laughs> take the pin all the way out of your... <laughs> if you remove... The forward takedown pin on your modern AR, uh, there is a problem, okay? It is not designed to work that way. But because we have to deal with these stupid pins here on the old school Colt, we're going to go ahead and just tighten that back up. But let's pretend all we did was go and push the pin. All right, now a functions test. Now, how many of y'all fail the functions test, or how many of y'all 
don't do this properly. What are we checking for when we do a function test? Are we just making sure the bolt moves? Or are we just or we make sure the trigger works? There's lots of things that we're going, going to go through here, right, that we want to check. Well, for one, this is where I see people do a functions test wrong right out the get-go, right? They never test the safety. They always put the gun on fire and then test the trigger reset. They like to hear the clicks. I get it. You know, we're creatures of habit in that regard. First thing I would do, obviously making sure the rifle's empty and there's no magazine or ammunition nearby and all that good happy stuff. Allow the bolt to come to a hard stop and slam. Before you even remove the safety, check the trigger. Does the safety work? <laughs> People don't ever test the freaking safety. And I don't understand, but, but they just don't. Okay, now we're going to put the rifle on fire. We're going to squeeze the trigger. We're going to leave the trigger held to the rear. Pull the bolt back to a hard stop. Let go. Allow it to slam forward. Release the trigger. You should hear, metallic, hear and feel metallic click. Okay, now the next part of the functions test that you want to do is put the gun on safe. All right, can you put the gun on safe? Is the answer yes? Okay, you pass that part of the functions test. That's something a lot of people don't do is even try to put it back on safe. I'd go ahead and test the safety again. All right, we can see the safety works, right? Good stuff, okay? All right, everything's good. And it feels nice and slick too. That grease really, really helped. There's one other thing I want to mention just real quick. While I'm talking, we'll, we'll put the sling back on there. I mean, you, you guys see what's going on here. You can, you can see the orientation that the sling goes in. I'm not going to bore you with those details. I'm just going to do it. Heck, I'll move it back. You can see what I'm doing. All right, we're going to go back through. We're going to open this up. I like to push it forward. You got, you know, generally a good bit of slack on the sling. Push it forward like this and then fish it back through. Back through again. All right. You know, get you a couple of inches there. Tighten her up. That looks good. And this particular sling is, is, is kind of a aftermarket sling that has fully adjustable. When I put this thing in the rack, I'll go ahead and adjust this sling up like this. We're gonna take all the slack out of the sling when we put it on the rack. And that way, that sling can't get caught up on a bunch of crap when it's on the rack. Now, if you wanna have the gun in a configuration that's ready to fight in, I wouldn't do that. But if you don't want it getting tangled up on your rack, that's one thing you can do to just to keep you know, everything nice and tight. All right, so we did a, a quick uh, functions test. Now we'll just lubricate this thing. Now, the cool thing about ARs, it's a self-lubricating system. And oh my gosh, I know people just turn it into so much of a, of a point of argument and everything. And I swear to God, good people, it's really just this simple, okay, to lubricate this gun. Don't over lubricate the mess out of it. See these holes? <laughs> those holes are there for a few different reasons. I'm not going to try to, you know, pretend to know every little tiny articulation of it, but the holes are there in case there's a gas ring failure to allow venting of gas forces and they do gas forces do come out of these holes but it's also a great area to just literally you're going to drop just one drop in each hole like that's it and maybe one more one more and i swear to god the gun is going to self-lubricate if you do that just put a few drops in there this is your bolt stop Hold it down. We already greased this notch. So we don't to worry about that. We already greased the trigger and all that good stuff. Just take like a couple of drops like that. Work that back and forth. Lock it to the rear. See that galling? Now, you don't have to get crazy on this. You could probably even run a light grease or a looper plate or even a, a copper anti-seize if you wanted to. Because it's not a super tight fit. I mean, look, look at that. 
I mean, there's a lot of tolerance there. It's, it's not like it's a super, super good tolerance or it's super tight fit. Just throw some freaking lube on the dang thing. You ain't got to do a lot, but, but you know, you can see the shininess where it kind of galls and rubs and things like that. And that's just going to help your sanity. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's a lot better having a little bit. Oh yeah. You don't feel that greediness and you don't feel that dragging and everything like that. Um, that's way better. Beautiful. All right, well, that's been our AR-15 cleanup. Um, I love the A2. I think it's an awesome gun. And um, yeah, I, I think we covered things pretty well uh, to the best of our ability here. And uh, that will definitely keep your AR running well if you take some of the points into consideration that I went through in this video. One more little just tidbit of information. It's not really important per se, uh, but maybe something folks may not know, okay? Most military triggers on, on ARs, you know, especially like an old school A2 or something like that, or an A1 or, or whatever, you know, something like this, usually the weight of the trigger exceeds the weight of the rifle. And I don't know why they thought of this or why it was ever a point or whatever, uh, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, check the rifle. It's empty, obviously. We're gonna put the gun on fire. All right, if this trigger is a military trigger, a mil spec trigger, I should be able to hang this rifle from my finger without the gun discharging on semi. That's a tall order, because I mean, this is what, like an eight pound rifle, nine pound rifle, so it'd have to be a pretty decent weight trigger to be able to do that. Instead of hanging it on my finger, I'm just, look, I got my vise tightened up, got this stud here. I'm gonna try setting it on this vise right here. I'm gonna take the weight off of it and let's see if it discharges. It does. All that really tells me is that this trigger is lighter than a military trigger. Most military rifles can have the, can support the weight of the rifle with the trigger being on fire, which is weird. You would think like, who, who thinks of that? But you're talking about Joe, okay? You're talking about soldiers and Marines. Like imagine <laughs> some guy, oh, I gotta, I gotta go hit the head real quick and let me hang my rifle up. I mean, how many people, would hang their rifle by the trigger, but they really do think of everything. So that's just one little interesting factoid, you know, might, might matter, might not. And again, we could take this Brownells XM177. All right, now granted that this is a, a, a lighter gun, okay, but let's see if it'll hang without discharging the 177. Wow. So that's a decent trigger on that gun, especially considering how light this rifle is. So just something that you can kind of, um, you know, try just to impress your buddies or maybe fail to impress them, I mean, who knows. All right, one last thing before we go, lead cleaning, uh, the lead cleaning wipes. You know, since I've been handling all this bull crap, you know, this is a, a great thing to have. You know, you, you do not want to get all that lead in your body, you know, and even though you're cleaning a rifle and everything like that, there's gonna be lead residue that you're gonna have mixed in with that carbon. And you do not want that stuff to get in your skin. Now, uh, you know, if you're doing a lot of cleaning with your hands on a regular basis, probably would not be a bad idea to just have some nitrile gloves on to protect your hands because you, you don't wanna ingest any of this lead residue, okay, into your body. Uh, it can do some very bad things. So just make sure you're paying attention to lead exposure. All right, well, there you have it. That's your AR. Um, of course, these uh, techniques can be used on a wide variety of different AR platforms. There's a ton of different stuff out there. Of course, we don't get into like different piston designs in terms of piston guns and things like that. But for your DI guns, this is gonna get you like 90% of the way there. Have a great day. Many more videos on the way. We'll see you soon.